Three, two, one. What's happening, guys? This is Logan Robinson from here, the Spear, presented to you by NolanGameDay.com. We are here live on a wonderful, fantastic Wednesday evening. Feels good to be back. Another break. Wasn't planned or time to be that way, but ended up happening. Tonsillitis sucks. No fun whatsoever. I used to get it when I was little, but I guess it came back and grabbed me this last week. But feeling better, feeling good, up for it. Always good to be back onto the show with the guys up ahead of me is Austin Vizi, our lead basketball writer at NoGamingDay.com. And down below is our editor-in-chief and recruiting recruiting guru. I need to add that on now that we're in June and July, going into July. Dustin Lewis, gentlemen, good to see you. We're back, baby. Yeah, good to be back. Like you said, it wasn't really a planned break, and now there's a lot on the docket tonight. And as for the guru part, I would just, just leave that off. Let's just, let's just stick with editor-in-chief. Well, there will be a lot of recruiting talk tonight, and it will be led by you, Dustin. But uh, we'll give our two cents here and there. But a lot of visitors More coming like into Tallahassee. <laughs> What's, well, BZ is actually going to give us a nope. big time don't, prediction. Don't, a don't put words in my mouth, please. No recruiting predictions from you? Probably not. Come on, come on, man. That's what everybody's looking for here on this show is to give, you, give, give us some recruiting predictions from your side. No. <laughs> not happening well that's fine we have a lot of recruiting to go over nonetheless uh, a big time official visit weekend with 14 recruits coming in town multiple commits and classes but we also heard from jordan travis and trey benson earlier this morning uh, we're going to talk about luke being at the elite 11 florida state's 2024 quarterback commit uh, we're going to talk some Jeremiah Smith, the number one wide receiver, Ohio State current commit, who just recently last weekend visited Florida State. We didn't get to touch on that because we didn't have a show last week. So we're just going to give our two cents on that visit and what it means, along with Charles Lester. He just took his ninth trip to Florida State. Is that within a month, Dustin? No, just like throughout oh, the shit. course of his uh, recruitment. I was like, oh, my God. I don't know how that would even be possible. But Charles Lester, though, I mean, this dude loves Tallahassee, so it wouldn't be any shocker. But he also is scheduling his commitment on July 29th. So we'll go into a discussion on the show tonight about that. We're going to talk some K.J. Bolden. It's the 2024 number one safety in the class. Actually, He actually spent a couple of days in Tallahassee as well. So mm -hmm. we'll discuss that. And then we're going to talk Dalvin Cook. Uh, the Dolphins reportedly made an offer over to him. And we're going to talk a little bit of basketball at the end. So a lot of things to jump through. We need to get started. But before we get going, make sure you hit the like button if you're on YouTube right now. It helps go to other FSU fans on the platform. If you're on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, make sure you hit subscribe on there. So then you will get notified every time we release a new episode. Got a lot to chat about. Let's get into some stuff, guys. Dre Benson, Jordan Travis, got to hear from them a scheduled press conference uh, to talk about summer workouts. Also, Jordan Travis being and attending at, at the uh, Manning Passing Academy. Did not participate, but he was there indeed. I saw him signing a lot of autographs, being with some fans, and also chopping it up with some of the other really talented quarterbacks. Uh, pretty good pretty good time there, but really specifically talking about workouts and what this team is doing during the offseason. Trey Benson uh, talking about working on his body. He said, you know, I asked him, you know, we saw him during the spring, Dustin, and that, that boy put on some pounds. I mean, you could see a significant jump in his size, and so that's why I wanted to ask him, is he, was he planning on trimming off some of that? And, yes, he is. He's going to go from 226 down to 220. He feels like he wants to keep his speed and utilize that and the only way to do that is to trim off a little bit of that weight but um you know what, what were your thoughts about the interviews today dust i know you, you and i and tommy were listening in and covering it any 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 key kind of takeaways from your end i would just say maybe something that stood out is uh as far as trey benson talking about him you know he mentioned that he's 100 percent recovered from that knee injury that he suffered back during his time at oregon that you know possibly could have ended his, ended his career. And, I mean, we even saw whenever he transferred to Florida State last year at times, uh, he was limited throughout practices and things. But, I mean, it sounds like he's completely over that, and that allowed him to do really a full off-season program for, I mean, if you think about it, I, I believe the first time that he's really been in college. And you mentioned that weight gain. That's probably a big reason why he's jumped up to that 226, you know, being able to be in the weight room and doing all that conditioning um, standard with FSU and legs, man, getting those legs. That's where you gain that weight doing those squats. 
But I think, I mean, that's just going to be huge in his development, you know, not having to worry about an injury, getting over hurdles of rehab and things like that. Instead, he's just in the, in the football activities, um, doing conditioning with the team. And I mean, just continuing to progress. And we even heard him talk about the offensive line a little bit. And he said, with the amount of experience coming back, he's not going to, he feels like he's not going to be 10 yards short of that 1000 yard mark this year. So, you know, we'll see if that happens. Uh, there was a couple of things that stood out to me from Jay Trav and Trey Benson, but sticking on Benson, just seeing his facial expressions after talking about Destin Hill, you know, Jordan Travis talking very highly about him saying that he's a really, really special player. And we've mm-hmm. heard some really good things about him during these summer workouts and coming here prepared, coming in shape and, you know, already trying to start to build some chemistry with the wide receivers. Jay Trav opened up and told us, you know, they do have their closed in workouts and they're not really practices, but they're running routes and they're passing. And, you know, at this time, you know, coaches can't get involved and make a whole play sheet. What here's this, what you're doing. But nonetheless, you know, Jordan Travis is a guy that's a leader now and he's turned into having to facilitate kind of these organized workouts and uh, practices almost to where he's trying to build chemistry with Keon Coleman now, Dustin Hill and a lot of the other newcomers that are in the stable now, but uh, just the comments about Dustin Hill and, you know, how impressive he's been to these two leaders on offense really stood out to me. Yeah. And you mentioned, you mentioned Keon Coleman. He had a lot of praise um, for him as well. The Michigan state wide receiver transfer, you know, him and Dustin both really still getting acclimated to their times at Florida state, but it sounds like out there in some of these early um, practices that are run by the players, They've uh, really been standing out. And like you said, Logan, sounds like Destin Hill has come in in tremendous shape. And Keon Coleman, one of the top rated players in the transfer portal in this spring cycle. And I mean, probably for the entire thing dating back to the winter, maybe the best wide receiver that hit the transfer portal market um, this kind of cycle. You know, he's been as advertised, a really special guy out there. And, you know, is going to bring an instant impact to Florida State's wide receiver room in a big way. Trey Benson also talking about Florida State season opener, which is now to think of it's not too crazy long. We're about to head into July. Time is going to start. It's already just blowing by, but we're getting close now to Florida State's 2023 season kickoff against LSU, which is expected to be a top 10 matchup. And Trey Benson was specifically asked about this and kind of just the mindset going into a game like this. You know, they already faced LSU, but these te- these two teams were not ranked last year which is crazy you know to think of now going into this season where this is a literal top 10 matchup and it changes a lot for the mindset for Florida State and uh, he he was talking about he said like I said taking it day by day blocking out all the noise Uh, two teams in the top 10 hey it's going to be a showdown but taking it day by day each game by each game and we're just ready to go Um, and so you know that's just kind of how this whole team's you know, theme is going through this off season, blocking out everything. And this Mm. is a different, this is something, this program, it's going to be something new for them. Definitely. Whenever you're getting this kind of praise, you're getting all these accolades before the season even begins is something that Florida state hasn't had in a little while, but you know, they've always had prime time, you know, opportunities and games and such, but for it to be now where they're ranked and now they're trying to make it to, you know, a college football playoff, it's a little bit different with your mindset and it's going to be really interesting to watch how this fall camp goes on with, you know, leaders and guys that can block out the noise like this. It's going to be a learning. It's going to be a learning curve for them. Agreed. We've talked, we've talked before how the expectations surrounding the team are going to be the biggest factor of how they go through summer and fall and, and into the games. If they can do like Trey Benson says and block out all this outside noise, it's only going to help them. But a lot of these guys have never had to deal with these kind of expectations before. Yep. And I think, you know, that's exactly what this team has to do. Don't don't think about all the expectations that are being put on the table by the media. Just go out, take it day by day, game by game, like Trey Benson said. And I mean, Jordan Travis said the same thing at another point in the interview. They're just focused on he's like, we got to work out today. We're focused on that. We got to work out tomorrow. We're focused on that. And then into fall camp. So, I mean, they're just really going day by day. And I think that's really important because like you guys have said, they haven't had this kind of success. They haven't come off a season a 10 win season or a season where, I mean, they've really even had a a positive record over the last couple of years. It's important not to get caught up in your own hype and just come out there and prove it. And especially when you're not going to have the uh, courtesy, the courtesy of a tune-up game 
this season before you play LSU instead. I mean, both teams are just kind of going to be thrown into the fire and you're going to have to come out early in September and in Orlando. And I mean, throw the first punch. Another thing, this is good comment here from James on YouTube talking about Jordan Travis and, you know, the weight that he's at. He told us that he's at 212. He plans on maintaining and keeping that weight throughout the season. You know, it's always tough in fall camp. We're going to see some guys trim off some weight nonetheless, but Jay Travis specifically wants to stay at that weight. Do y'all feel like that's a pretty good weight to be at? I mean, I, some people want him to get to like 220, 225, but you've also got to understand, man, the first, the, the best talent, the talent, the rich talent that you get from Jordan Travis is those legs down there. I don't want to see him just like, you know, Trey Benson, he's going to shave off six pounds before the season. That's his plan. I don't need to see Jay Trav at 215, 220. You know, that's a guy that knows how to utilize his body. Well, his balance, he's one mm-hmm. of the most athletic players we see in college football right now. I don't need him putting on any kind of crazy pounds, but I think 212 is pretty safe. The biggest thing I think for me is just playing at a safe weight. You know, add a little bit of muscle so then, you know, you get knocked a little bit here and there. You can get up and, you know, lick your wounds and you're good to go. But I think 212 is pretty fun. Pretty much agree with your take there. And, I mean, everyone knows muscle weighs more than fat. And, you know, even if Jay Trav isn't sitting up there at 220 pounds, he's definitely put on a significant amount of muscle over the past couple of years compared to when he first took the reins um, under Mike Norvell back in 2020. I mean, you can see the guy's body has grown tremendously over the past couple of years, especially his lower body, he's put on some serious size down there. So, I mean, and I think, you know, when you look at his body type as well, where he's at fits him uh, extremely well and even better, you know, he's become smarter as the years have gone by at avoiding hits, uh, taking big hits. I think you're going to see him put a bigger emphasis on that in 2023 as well. Yeah. He was about 185, 190 as a recruit came to Florida state from Louisville at about 200, 202, somewhere on there. So I think 212 is a pretty safe way for him. Yeah, agreed. I think that'll be that'll be just fine. I think just over the theme of the press conference, guys just get into work. You know, we see a few videos and photos here and there from the FSU official accounts, and you're seeing some guys out there grinding and whatnot, but it's kind of been a little, little quiet almost. You know, I think Winston Wright, he put out a video on his Instagram story, and of course it got deleted. I was going to go post it earlier to try to get my clout up, but uh, yeah, he deleted it, but it showed that he was looking pretty good, man. I don't know if y'all saw that video, but Winston was – moving probably the best I've seen him move you know Dustin you and I have seen him quite a bit and you know it's always felt like you know it's it's almost there it's almost clicking but I swear uh, that did look pretty good at least you know we only get to see the best of what he's showing (laughs) us and it's one route so not gonna be like oh my god Winston's back watch out wide receiver three watch out but it is good to see him. The biggest thing for me was always, I just want to see him look a hundred percent and, you know, be able to take on full contact and such. Mm-hmm. And if there's a way that he's making that next step, man, I mean, we keep on forgetting about that. You know, Winston Wright is still on this roster who played a pivotal role in being a deep threat and being an elusive player at West Virginia. He's still on this roster. Just can he be good to go? But I, I thought that was worth mentioning earlier today. I saw a lot of people talking about it in the discord and on Twitter. We'll see how it goes. I mean, he still looked like he had a ways to go um, back in spring camp. At the same time, I think Florida State was still limiting him a little bit and just trying to keep him protected, you know, slowly building up the confidence in that leg because there was no point in having him go all out in spring ball and risking him getting hurt. But now, you know, as we go into the fall and we're talking about Winston Wright's last season of collegiate eligibility, this is the last chance for him. This is the last chance for Florida State to utilize him in Tallahassee. So I, I think you're going to see him come out with a, you know, a renewed focus, a renewed purpose during fall camp to really show that he's back from that injury that he suffered, you know, going on 18 months or so at this point, some something in that time range that he can get back out there and make an impact for FSU in the slot. And I think it's really going to be important for him once the pads come on in fall camp, take some hits, go to the ground, pop right back up because I don't want to say he looked timid during the spring, but it just seemed like maybe he was thinking about, getting hit still a little bit you want to see that kind of see him shake that off a little bit 100 percent, yeah and you know that would be we would both be the same way you know after going yeah. through a tragic accident like that an incident recovering like that's that's just gonna come with it any guy you can listen to any running back and torn your acl wide receiver you know it, it, it's gonna take a couple pops and that's just exactly what it's gonna have to take during the fall camp if we're gonna see him participate in this 2023 season so mm-hmm. we'll see jordan jordan travis has talent everywhere 
but then we kind of forget Winston Wright is still on this roster, which is just crazy. It just fathoms me that, you know, this is how much talent that Mike Norvell has been able to bring into this room. Shout out to Ron Dugans, the donk as well. But uh, let's jump into some official visit stuff. D. Lou, uh, a big time weekend of a lot of recruits in town, including commits. Your bell cow with Luke Kromenhock being in attendance, along with some other guys like Camden Fryer. You had Cam Davis as well. I mean, it, it just kept on going and going and going, along with some major, major targets too, D. Lou. You, you just tell me the theme of the day, and then we'll kind of start jumping through a few names. Was it raining? Was it hot? What were the vibes like? Did you need sunscreen? Oh, I always, I always need sunscreen. It doesn't matter if it's overcast outside. <laughs> I tried that in February and got sunburnt. But Irishman. I mean, man, so many guys on campus this weekend. I guess we can start off. We can just go by um, all the names and just name everyone that was there. But fourteen official visitors. Um, the biggest recruiting weekend for Mike Norvell so far since he has arrived in Tallahassee. Um, so, yeah, just to name off all fourteen guys. Four-star quarterback commit Luke Cromanhawk. Four-star running back, Makai Danzi. Four-star wide receiver commit, Camden Fryer. Four-star wide receiver commit, TJ Abrams. Four-star wide receiver, Elijah Moore. Four-star wide receiver, James Madison. Four-star wide receiver, Zion Reagans. You sense in a theme here. Five-star tight end commit, Landon Thomas. Four-star tight end, Kylan Fox. Four-star offensive lineman, John Daniels. Three-star offensive lineman, uh, Ty Hilton. Four-star defensive end, D.D. Holmes. Four-star defensive back, Jalewis Solomon. And four-star defensive back commit, C.J. Hurd. So that was a lot of words by itself. But, I mean, just a huge amount of guys coming in for Florida State. Five commitments, um, nine targets. I think really the theme of this weekend was trying to make some moves towards landing some of these top guys as well as, you know, when you look at the committed list, T.J. Abrams, a guy who uh, pledged to Florida State, Back in January, this official visit was his first time in Tallahassee since making his commitment. So, I mean, one thing they wanted to do is try and lock him down a little bit. Sound like the visit went pretty well. Um, he also visited uh, Florida and Texas A&M during June. So, I mean, a guy who's still exploring his options despite his commitment. And it sounds like uh, based off what he said after the visit, he's going to continue, maybe take some more visits during the fall. Not exactly locked down with FSU quite yet but as far as the rest of the commitments i mean luke cromanhawk feeling extremely good coming out of his visit i think florida state has some good news coming up camden fryer seems like he's uh, pretty locked in with fsu the legacy whose dad was a member of the 1993 national championships team his uncle was a member of the uh, 1999 national championship team and fryer trying to uh follow in those footsteps a little bit. Landon Thomas, same thing. A guy coming to Tallahassee pretty much has his recruitment shut down at this point. That was something he said after the visit. He's uh, unofficially shut down his recruitment, so maybe trending to officially do it here in the uh, the near future or so. And then also C.J. Hurd, a guy who's been committed to FSU for over a year at this point and is pretty solid in his pledge. I think as long as Florida State wants to keep him in the boat, they're going to be able to. But, I mean, man, where do you where do you want to go with this? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I think the new thing, the new age of recruiting is first you, co- you get recruited, then you're like a silent, and then you commit to the school, and then now the new thing is going to be I'm locking down my recruitment. That's now going to be the biggest thing. Like you're just saying there with Landon, like I still think he's definitely really solid with Florida State's recruitment, but I think that's just how it's going to go in the next couple yeah. of years. I can already taste it. It's just how, it's, how it should. I mean, why not? Just lead us on a little bit longer. Definitely Florida State fans will fiend for any of it. But uh, uh, let's start um, Let's start off with some of the target. I think people on here on YouTube and our listeners on the podcast, audio version, they want to hear kind of these targets that – Florida State's in a good spot for. I think we should discuss some of these guys because there's some really good talent right here. For sure. Yeah, and to your point on uh, Landon, you know, maybe the next step being locking it down, we saw the same thing with Luke and Cam back towards the uh, spring showcase. They both put out the graphics and, you know, shutting down their recruitment. It's 100% in with FSU. So, I mean, maybe you're right. Maybe that's the uh, the new hotness nowadays. But, you know, guys coming out of the weekend that I think Florida State sits in a good position for. Got to start off with four-star running back, Makai Danzi, 
from right across the street, basically down over there at uh, Florida High, you know, about 20 minutes away from, from campus or so. And, I mean, this month he only took an official visit to Florida State, no other programs, um, do, is going to visit Miami and Florida in December. But he wants to make a commitment this summer, and sounds like track is very important. As Along with football, Florida State is recruiting him to uh, play both in college. Uh, so, I mean, if he does commit to FSU, you'll have another dual sport athlete in the class, and that adds on with Cam Davis and Camden and TJ Abrams as well if, if he sticks. So a lot of uh, a lot of dual dual sport guys yeah. coming in, but I was gonna I was gonna mention just he's a different type of caliber running back than Cam Davis too. You know, you yeah. add a little bit more of a some maybe elusiveness. I would say, um, just watching a little bit of his tape. I was watching earlier this week just because I had nothing else to freaking do. So I was seeing some of the guys coming in, but just looking at what you could do in this offense with having a Cam Davis. You already know the talent that he brings and the magnitude there, but <clears throat> his, uh, his talent of being able to kind of move around is something that Florida state would probably really like to utilize. Yeah. And Florida state, they're kind of comparing him to uh, Lawrence Toa Philly at the next level. Which, Lawrence, man. I mean, I, I kind of agree Lawrence. with it. A guy who can flex out of that backfield into the slot can work as a receiver a little bit. And, you know, we're talking about a long strider, someone who likes to go sideline to sideline, and maybe the most impressive thing is his speed. Well, it is the most impressive thing. This guy is the second fastest 200-meter dash runner in the world for uh, the under-18 age group. So, I mean, if Florida State's able to land him, you're feeling good on the football field and on the track. Uh, we love we love fast players, if you guys and others, a lot of people that uh, listen to the podcast. We talk about a lot of track guys, and we've had Marvin Bracey on here before, but when you bring some elite speed, definitely to an offense like Magna Ravel's where they utilize explosive plays and you and, and taking care of their playmakers, it kind of just makes sense. But I, I'm just, you know, interested to see if that can match up really well with Cam Davis. But I like the kind of relation there to, um, to a Philly. That was what I was thinking as well. And I guess That's what Magna Ravel likes can... having in his roster. That's what he likes having back there in his stable. Got to have a gadget player in that backfield. Mm -hmm. But – I guess next we can go to the the trio of four star wide receivers, well, uncommitted wide receivers that joined the duo of committed wide receivers. I mean, just an absurd amount of uh, wide receivers in Tallahassee this past weekend. Um, so we'll start with Elijah Moore. I didn't really know a lot about him coming into the weekend. He had, he had previously been to Florida State one time and you know took an OV to Ohio State earlier this month, but. After the visit, it sounds like things went really well. He clicked with uh, Mike Norvell and Ron Dugans. Coming out of the trip, named Florida State his leader over Ohio State and is set to announce his commitment on June 4th between FSU and OSU. And, you know, he was asked a little bit about the decision. He said he pretty much already has his mind made up and just has to make a couple of business calls. So we'll see how this one goes. But, I mean, from, from what I've heard um, from the FSU side, they feel like they're in a very good spot here. And if I had to make a prediction right now, I think Florida State is going to pull Elijah mm. Moore on July 4th. So some fireworks coming to Tallahassee. He looked impressive just in size and frame too. I know we were talking about it, I think in the Discord or something, but he looks really good for size-wise. And just his comments alone, if you're there on campus and you're having that comment of, I think I've already got my main, my mind made up and I just got to yeah. make a few business calls, then I've – feel like that's probably the school that you'll end up picking but yeah that, that kid is talented and I don't think a lot of FSU fans were really keeping an eye on him before he arrived I really liked him probably had the most impressive frame out of any wide receiver out there and you know when you look at the FSU obviously has four wide receivers already committed in this class but he's a much different player you know the other guys are are smaller speedier some can play in the slot this is a guy who's going to be an outside wide receiver a deep threat a potential red zone monster if he reaches his potential um, Elijah Moore could be a good one for Florida State and then we'll move over to James Madison another guy who's at that uh, six foot three six foot four mark who could be utilized in the red zone a ton and plays over at uh, St. Thomas Aquinas but uh, Madison has been a uh, been to Florida State a bunch of times. Seems like the Seminoles have always kind of been trending in this recruitment and, you know, got to feel pretty good after getting the last visit. 
Um, as far as him, he's another one who's trending to a July 4th decision. That one's going to come down to FSU, Missouri, and Louisville, the three teams that he officially visited in June. And I feel like if Florida State wants him, then he's going to end up as a Seminole. But if not, then he'll probably – go to Missouri. I noticed a couple of his uh, St. Thomas Aquinas teammates have committed to Missouri as well. So, I mean, I think this just comes down to does Florida State want to add a, you know, if they get Elijah Moore, do they want to add a six wide receiver commitment in uh, early July? And that's just a conversation that you've got to figure out (laughs) because you've still got uh, JoJo Trader on the board. Obviously, Jeremiah Smith, we're going to get to here in a little bit. So do you want to go ahead and take a six wide receiver or do you want to wait it out? I, I just think it's interesting now where Florida State's at a position to do this. I mean, we used point. to come on here a ton and complain and complain and complain and wonder what's going on in the wide receiver room. Okay, cool. We got some transfers. But now on the recruiting side of things, it's looked a lot more sharp. But shout out to the staff and what Dugans is doing as well it's a good spot to be in, but I mean, it makes for some tough decisions for sure, but this is exactly where you do want to be though, at a, as a program for sure. We'll close out the wide receivers with uh, Zion Reagans, which first trip to Florida state in well over a year, this was his official visit. This one seems like it's coming down to FSU, Oklahoma and Ohio state. And he hasn't announced an official date yet, but said he's trending towards a decision in July. And I mean, just based off his comments, you know, I don't think that he's necessarily favoring Florida State at this time. We'll see how things go moving forward. And he's also someone who's about five foot eight. So, I mean, he doesn't really do a lot much different than what Florida State already has committed. I would say maybe if a guy like TJ Abrams does decommit and go somewhere else, or, you know, even Loane McCoy, who hasn't seen the most solid in his pledge as of late, if you lose one of those guys, maybe you turn up the heat on uh, Reagan's but I mean right now he just doesn't do at least in my opinion he doesn't he doesn't do a ton different than what you already have true true that was a that's a that's a busy weekend overall and I think too with having even close Davis to I know well with having Davis and what I'm saying is Luke being there and helping recruit and then Cam Davis those mm-hmm. two locking down their commitments and I think Landon Thomas too maybe internally as well that kind of stuff picking up steam and maybe there's some other, you know, ones out there that are helping out doing some recruiting that we don't even maybe know of. That's uh, maybe on Florida state's side that could be helping out in different ways, but it just goes to show what this 2024 class has a potential to be if they can put out a good product this upcoming season. But what else uh, went down throughout this whole entire weekend? So, yeah, we'll move on to a uh, four-star tight end, Kylan Fox and Florida state. They've kind of, perused adding a second tight end to this class. Not really sure if it's something they want to do or not, considering you do have the number one tight end in the country, Landon Thomas, committed. And, you know, you've got some young talent in your tight end room at the moment where if you add another freshman, does it make a lot of sense when there are maybe some other positions in the class that you could address moving forward? Um, I would say Florida State was probably the perceived favorite for Fox coming into the weekend. And then basically, like less than an hour after he departed campus on Sunday, you had um, on three put in a prediction for Kylan Fox to end up at UCF. And it seems like from the FSU side, that's maybe starting to become the expectation. Um, Not sure the visit necessarily went as Florida State wanted here, but at the same time, I don't think FSU's really kicking itself because it gives you a spot if Kylan Fox does commit to UCF. It gives you a spot to put somewhere else on offense or on defense as well. Yeah, I mean, not going to complain too much when you have the number one tight end already in your class, and it makes yeah. sense for him. You know, if you want to get a better opportunity somewhere else and you're going to get that full playing time, go for it. You know, I don't right. think this should be something that FSU fans will be, oh, my God, or, you know, we're, we're, we're screwed. And that's definitely not the case whatsoever. And also what you got kind of cultivating right now in your current roster at the tight end position. So, let you know, let, let them, you know, find a place that can better utilize him for better – and more playing time, you know, that's completely fine. It's just more of, I think Landon Thomas has a good friendship with him. So, yep. you know, just trying to tangle him in and stuff, but you know, I think I'm all for a player doing what he thinks is best for him. So we'll see what ends up happening there. 
think they were exploring to see if it was the right option, but he also knows if he picks UCF, you know, he's going to be the number one tight end in their 2024 class 100%. and maybe have an opportunity to play earlier at the college level. You know, you think about Florida State, Marquise and Douglas expected to come back um, next season. You've still got Brian Courtney and Jarrell Powers. I'm not really sure about the eligibility situation with Preston. I'll have to check on that. And uh, Jackson West still there. Kyle Morlock is probably a guy that's going to come back for a second year of eligibility. Jaheen yeah. Bell, I think most of us would think right now he's going to make the lead to the NFL after the 2023 season. But, I mean, you're still – you're, and then you're at Landon Thomas in. So, I mean, you're still thinking at least six scholarship guys in that room for 2024. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely Marquise and highlighted Marquise and Douglas, Darrell Powers. Hopefully we see the next step being taken – by him getting some PT this upcoming season as well. Um, yeah, that tight end room is nice. It's nice to talk about. Never used to be that way. All right, we've only got four more to go. Um, let's go down to the offensive line now. Florida State hasn't gone the way they expected it to go in June to this point. Uh, FSU's number one interior option, Jason Zandamella, ended up committing to USC after his official visit there earlier in June. You also had one of their top offensive tackle targets, a guy who was on campus in the spring, uh, Manassi ITT, commit to USC as well following an official visit. So, I mean, you had two of the top offensive linemen go off the board. They were both scheduled to be here in this last weekend of June, but after those commitments decided not to take the visits, we'll see if Florida State, I think they're going to stay involved on Zandamel and maybe try to get an official in the fall, but – as for this weekend, you had two guys come in on the offensive line. That was four-star offensive lineman John Daniels and three-star Ty Hilton. Um, for me, I think coming out of the weekend, Florida State, probably the favorite right now for John Daniels. He hasn't announced a commitment date just yet, but, I mean, we did see him tweeting at Hayes Fawcett during the visit, trying to get a graphic made. Don't know if that's necessarily for a top schools list or a commitment at this time, but – Regardless, it sounds like he's getting closer to wrapping up the uh, the process and has a really good relationship with Alex Atkins and Mike Norvell, was uh, with Luke Cromanhawk a ton during the trip, and we even saw them pull up together in the same car in, in Mike Norvell's um, Maybach during the second day of the visits. I mean, Cromanhawk really throwing the hat into the ring there to try and get FSU's first offensive line commitment of the class Um you know, we'll see. This this guy is really coveted by a lot of programs across the country. But, you know, I think Florida State, they, they've got a close place to his heart. And if I had to pick right now, I think they're going to win out in the recruitment. And then you go to Ty Hilton. Really seems like this one is a FSU, Florida, Miami battle. FSU got the last visit. He's another one that wants to commit this summer, if so. And I think he's got the green light from Florida State since they brought him in on official. If, if he wants to commit, I, I think that he also would commit to the Seminoles at this point in time. And, I mean, those would be two nice little pieces to uh, kind of get the class started. And we'll see if FSU is able to get back in on Zandamella, who, I mean, is one of the most impressive offensive linemen in this entire class. Offensive line, offensive line, baby, give me them all. Coach Atkins, while you have them here, you know, trying to stock up and bring in some talent. Florida State continues to do a good job on that front, but it's nice to see the recruiting continue over there, which is already whenever you go to practices, D'Lo, it's like a whole friggin' army over there of guys. But you got to keep reloading, man, and also continuing to develop what you have inside. And then you also bring in these transfers. You know, they've got something cooking there for the offensive line. So I think players, recruits, these high profile targets at in that position group is eyeing down what coach Atkins is doing you know it's hard to really ignore it at this point Seminoles also had one defensive lineman in Tallahassee this past week and that was four-star defensive end D.D. Holmes from uh, up in Maryland and this was I believe his second time checking out Tallahassee since the spring um, spent a lot of time around Mike Norvell Adam Fuller Coach JP and, you know, really just building relationships along with his family to see if maybe coming this far from home would be something that's good for him. And I mean, I got to say, kids uh, looks really impressive for a guy entering his uh, senior season of high school, about six foot six, 240 pounds, give or take. I mean, already looking really like a college edge rusher Um, based off his comments. He departed pretty early 
on Sunday morning, but also officially visited uh, Rutgers, South Carolina, and home state Maryland during the uh, recruiting process in June. Florida State got the last visit here. Another one who hasn't set a clear announcement date, but is thinking about committing sometime this summer or might take it a little bit into his senior season. Based off the competition, I'll say it again, Rutgers, South Carolina, and Maryland, and Florida State not having any defensive end commitments at this time. You know, Dylan Stevenson committed to uh, Stanford earlier this month, and I think there was at least one more that went elsewhere in Florida State. Not really having a ton of traction with top uh, defensive linemen across the country as we sit right here at the end of June. You know, I think they really need to throw as many resources as they can into this commitment and get Dee Dee Holmes. Sounded like the visit went extremely well. I was actually watching a little bit of his Instagram live on, I think it was Friday night or Saturday night, Friday night. And I'm pretty sure I heard his uh, mom say during the IG live, you know, Florida State looks like home or some some kind of – iteration such as that but by all accounts it went well for dd went well for the family we'll see if florida state can win out here yeah there's a couple comments in here from our listeners uh talking about you know defensive line recruiting and that's something that you know we talked about a couple months ago that's something that has got to be worked on and got to be better you know got to bring in some First, just bring some depth in, but some talent would also be nice. But you can't fully rely on the transfer portal every year. I know we keep saying that, and Minervell continues to always have backup plan B, C, D, and E. But still, you know, you want to also bring in your guys that you can develop there. But, you know, right now, you know, you've got Tafase, who is one that I think we are pretty high on, still got a lot of more work to do to develop wise. You lost Bishop Thomas. With the transfer portal, we really, really like what we've seen from Daniel Lyons, and he continues to make steps and strides and strides, and he's going to be a player that's going to be utilized quite a bit this upcoming season. Whenever your top guys are down and need some, you know, need some rest, Daniel Lyons will be in the game. But still, we, you've got to bring in some more guys in this upcoming class, and I'm interested to see what Odell Hagens and Adam Fuller, what they're going to be able to do with this upcoming class. There's got to be some depth built. We're going to see how it goes. Uh, They got a long way to go. I'll say that. Some guys on the board, but, I mean, just not a ton of traction at this time. I think Dylan Stevenson, I mean, kind of like Xander Mello, I think you can get back on him during the season. Um, You know, you got to think going out to Stanford for that official visit and with everything that the university has to offer, not only athletically but also academically, I mean, it's kind of hard to pass that up. But I mean, maybe as time goes on and the visit high kind of wanes off and we are talking about a kid from, you know, South Florida, who's right now committed to play his future all the way across the country in California. I think that's something that Florida state can kind of pick at a little bit in the fall and try to push to keep him home because this was a guy who grew up an FSU fan. And I mean, FSU was the favorite basically since uh, the beginning of the year, but lost out on this one. Another guy that, whenever y'all posted some photos of him looks good in size, you know, that's another dude that just looks the part for sure. So we'll see what ends up happening there. Anything to conclude on anything left in there that you can give us last one. uh, We'll talk Mm -hmm. about four star DB Lewis Solomon FSU getting the final official visit here before his decision. Once again, hasn't announced a for sure date for a commitment, but actually, just put out a top five um, yesterday. Florida State made the cut along with Auburn, South Carolina, Kentucky, and Texas A&M. Texas A&M. Right now, I think this is more of a three-team race between FSU, South Carolina, and Auburn. FSU and South Carolina are both recruiting Jill Lewis as a defensive back at the next level, while Auburn is looking at him more as a offensive player, athlete, wide receiver type of deal. Um, based off his comments following his uh, official visit to Florida State, he said FSU is in the lead right now coming out of June. Um, he's sounds like he's all about playing on the defensive side during his college career. Also mentioned that Florida State has plans to get his get the ball in his hands as a returner on special teams, potentially at some point during his career if he does choose FSU. So, I mean, we'll see how this goes. I think Florida State, they're in a good position here. Um, he said that they, they're looking at him more as a cornerback that can also play in the nickel. And, you know, I, I, 
I think it really just comes down to, and it's the same thing as the wide receivers, do you want to take this many cornerbacks in the summer? Because Florida State, you know, we're going to get to it, but in a good spot for Charles Lester. Um, you've got Ricky Knight committing on July 4th, a four-star cornerback who officially visited earlier this month. It's between FSU and Miami there. And you've got three-star cornerback um, Kevin Levy, who was at FSU earlier this month and seems like it's between Illinois and Rutgers there at this point. But Levy and Knight are actually both cousins. And, I mean, during all their trips except for one, they've all been – they've both been there at the same time to uh, Florida State and – They didn't flat out say they want to play together at the college level, but I've got a feeling that's kind of the preference. So, I mean, if you have um, Charles Lester, Ricky Knight, and Levy in the boat, do you want to pull in Lewis as well? If you're asking me, I'm going to say yes, mainly – well, not mainly, but just because it helps Florida State out in the future. Lewis's brother is actually a five-star linebacker in the 2025 class, Zayden Walker. And he joined him on the official visit this past weekend and really got to go through the experience right us right alongside you, Lewis, even down to the point of, you know, trying on uniforms together and going through the photo shoot, having Mike Norvell there. So I think getting him, it helps Florida State now. And it also helps maybe in that 2025 class of potentially bringing in a five star linebacker. Mm, mm, mm. Nothing better than a good old five star linebacker. You can go and sign me up, catches my attention right away. Mm. Would be nice. Would be very, very nice. So does that wrap up? Is that a that is, is that officially wrap up official visit weekend? I think that wraps it up. I just want to harp on Ricky Knight committing on uh, July 1st this Saturday, and James Madison, Elijah Moore, both expected to announce their decisions on Tuesday, July 4th. Mm. So we got a busy early July, baby. You know, I know some fans were question marking, you know, after Florida grabbed a whole ton of a commit. Of course, it happened in a 24, 48 hour span, Florida and Billy Napier loading up on some commits. So Mm -hmm. started seeing Twitter and FSU Twitter see some crumbling as they are. And, you know, there's no football games being played right now. There's absolutely nothing, no sports right now. So right now it's perfect time for FSU Twitter to spaz out and freak themselves out but i think florida state fans should be pretty happy with how july will begin and also how it may end so (laughs) and if you look at it if you look at it logically which i mean i know know that's kind of hard to do for some florida state fans (laughs) come on now yeah florida is coming off a non-bowl eligible season under billy napier you know already kind of building some fire there on the hot seat in Gainesville, it's really important for him to gain some positive momentum, some positive news right now in the off season before the season starts and it all goes off the rails again. Whereas Florida state, you're coming off a 10 win season, been a lot more successful as of late. I don't think that they're necessarily pushing as hard to lock these guys down when they're ever, whenever they're in Tallahassee, they want them to go through the process, make the decision and commit to Florida state. And I, I think that's going to pay off in July. Um, at least five times. Mm, mm, mm. Five times. At least five. Mm. Oh, at least. Maybe okay. More. Oh, keeping us on our toes over here. Let's do it. Sign me up. Let's go. Uh, well, that's good. That that was a crazy busy weekend overall. And you, Tommy, crazy busy month. Yeah. No joke. Well, I'm about to jump backwards now because we weren't available. And we're just only going to touch on a few players here that need to be talked about and discussed for sure for our listeners. But uh, let's talk about Jeremiah Smith. This is the number one wide receiver in the 2024 class, one of the top athletes, one of the top recruits in his class as well. And as a current Ohio State wide receiver commit, Ohio State always continues to push out product into the NFL. There's no debate about that. But Florida State trying to make a little push here. There was some chatter before he even arrived that, you know, he was going to go bounce around and visit a few schools. He also visited Georgia as well. But, you know, if that visit went and been had, you know, I just kind of want to just keep it straight up. Is Florida State even, like, does it make sense? I mean, obviously, Florida State would love to add this talent, but when you're going against his commitment to Ohio State and, you know, you see him also being kind of a bell cow for his class, but then he goes off and goes across the country and visits, visits Florida State. Like, it's it's a little interesting to me. You know, Florida State, they've, they've been in the mix for a lot of these guys before, but it ends up not going in their way. 
But if you kind of were to mix in a nice season ahead, if Florida State's able to do what we, I think, are expecting them to do, you know, that definitely turns some heads a little bit and keeps the eye on your program a little bit more for a guy like Jeremiah Smith with his talent, man. It's, it's watching that tape. It's, it's fun. I don't think you ever give up on a top five prospect because you just never know what's going to happen in these recruitments, especially when you're talking about a guy who's continuing to take visits, been in Tallahassee now for uh, the, the unofficial visit, uh, the multi-day unofficial visit that started on June 19th, went to uh, the late hours of June 20th, second trip to Tallahassee since March. So, I mean, this is a guy who's returning to Tallahassee. It sounds like he's going to end up taking, potentially taking an official visit to Florida State during that uh, game against Miami in November. He's already used his official visit to Ohio State. He went to Florida on an official visit at the beginning of the month. I, I'm not sure if he made it to Miami this past weekend, but I mean, you're talking about being one of, you know, three, four, or five schools that might end up getting him for an official visit during his recruitment. You're going to do it late in the recruiting cycle. You're going to do it against a team where you're talking about a guy who's from around that Miami area. He's going to get to watch FSU play against a team that he grew up, um, you know, watching and is also still considering. So I think Florida State, you've got to keep trying here. I don't think, you know, you're pulling out all the stops in this recruitment, but, I mean, you're going to continue to give yourselves a chance. And I think I mentioned it the last time we were on here or, or so, but, you know, you never know about Ohio State. Ryan Day, this might be his last year in Columbus if they don't beat Michigan again. And he's also someone that's flirted with jobs at the NFL level in the past. You know, at the very least, it seems like, He's not going to be at Ohio State for the entirety of his coaching career. He's still someone that's looking around and exploring his options. And then same thing with Brian Hartline, um, a rising coach in college football. Now, you do have to consider if Ryan Day was to move on somewhere, would Brian Hartline be the head coach at Ohio State? I think it's a possibility. I don't know that it's a, a definite thing that, that you can say. And I think that's one reason that Jeremiah Smith is continuing to look around, just making sure he has his options in the in the case that – Day leaves Ohio State. Brian Hartline leaves Ohio State just to make sure. And, yeah. you know, we saw the same thing with Travis Hunter. It looked like he was so locked into Florida State towards the end of his recruiting process. And then he took one visit and it all changed. You can't say that name here. Oh, I'm sorry. What name was it? Hunter Travis. It? Yeah, there you go. Uh, Hunter Travis. <laughs> No, yeah. We'll see. I don't know. You know, I think it's just great for Florida State putting themselves in this position. Like you're saying, just just put yourself there. Never know what could happen once we get through the rest of the season, get through middle of the season. You know, you never know where we could get when it comes to signing day. So Florida State doing that with a lot of targets, some of the top targets in the country, putting themselves and building relationships. I think that was probably one of the biggest things they wanted to get him here for. Just start really continuously building those relationships. And the donk, the donk ain't leaving. Donk ain't leaving. So it's parked. It's full of gas. It's ready to go. So uh, we'll see if Florida State is able to continue that recruitment and you know try to make a potential flip there. But that's a really talented player that Florida State would love to have on their st- in their stable of we talked about earlier that wide receiver room and it's yeah. absolutely stupidly stacked at the moment. But um, yeah, we'll keep an eye on that recruitment. Uh, before we talk about Charles Lester, if you guys are on YouTube right now, we got almost 150 on here as we speak. Make sure you hit that like button. This goes out to more FSU fans, and they can come over here and jump over to our YouTube live videos. We do this every Wednesday at 7 p.m., and it will continue going into the season. And once we get to games, we will have previews for you guys every weeknight on Wednesday nights, and then we will do a recap, instant reactions after the game. Sometimes we'll be in attendance for those as well, right on the field, give you guys our thoughts. So uh, we've got a tons of content left and right coming to you guys, but you just hitting the like button tonight helps a ton. And uh, you don't even have to subscribe. Definitely would love for you to comment and stuff, but if you just smack that like button, it would be deeply appreciated. Let's talk Charles Lester, big time Florida state five-star target cornerback would love to add on a talented cornerback. It's been, you know, kind of a minute since they've had something of this caliber and magnitude of talent on their team. Uh, but going to Charles Lester, a guy that's visited nine times 
to FSU continues to kind of almost be like a hidden bell cow in some sort of way, always showing some respect and love for Mike Norvell on Twitter, backing up the Florida State Seminoles and some arguments I've seen on Twitter as well. You know, you would think this guy is already in the fold, but, you know, nonetheless, yeah, Florida State's in a great spot for Lester. He just had his recent visit, uh, Mm -hmm. not this last week, but two weekends ago. How'd that go? Um, and you know, now we have our, we have a commitment date, Dustin, it's going to be on July 29th, the end of the month of next month. Yeah. I think based off him setting the commitment date, you've got to say that the visit went pretty well. Um, you know, I think Florida State they kind of checked off all the boxes here. Uh, Lester was able to come alongside his family, spend some more time building that bond with, uh, Patrick Sertan, you know, that's still a relatively new relationship there, but, it sounds like even though they've only been talking, you know, for six months or so, they've really started to, to develop a close connection with one another. And, and Lester is excited about the possibility of playing under him in college. Um, same thing with Mike Norvell. You know, I think that's a, a huge reason why Florida State is at the forefront of this recruitment. And, you know, I said earlier this month, I think FSU is going to end up landing this commitment from Charles Lester. And now that we actually have our date, you know, we're only about a month away or so from hopefully officially getting him into the fold for the uh, 2024 class. But, I mean, like I said, I think the trip went really well, and that's even just enhanced by the fact that he didn't end up taking that a final that final official visit he had scheduled to Georgia. Instead, he, he took an unofficial visit to Michigan State, who, you know, I don't consider a major player – in his recruitment at this time. So, I mean, I do have Florida State as the favorite here. Um, I've had them as the favorite for a while, I would say. And, you know, we've even heard Charles Lester in the past, back during that visit in the spring when he was here for the, uh, I think it was the FSU Legacy Weekend or one of those spring practices. He, he basically said, he's like, I've, I've been committed to Florida State, but I haven't been committed. So, I mean, <laughs> I think I think this is basically as silent as a commitment as you're going to get. And uh, we will see if it all pays off in July. But I think Florida State is going to land him. And it's going to be a really nice addition to this 2024 class. And he's someone that a lot of elite prospects are going to want to play with. And, you know, he's going to do his part on the recruiting trail alongside some of these other guys like Luke Croman Hawk and Cam Davis, Camden Fryer. We even Landon Thomas, you know, this past weekend getting involved. He's going to do his part alongside those guys to try and build something special at Florida State. We some great shots that Charles took with Minor Bell. Just sitting there pondering. There's Coach Sertan. But, yeah, I think Florida State's – don't really need to say more. You know what I love, too, is watching Minor Bell rock uh, Robert Scott's custom shoes yep. that he made for him. Check these out. It's kind of hard to see, I think, on the live stream. But Robert Scott, I don't know if we touched about touched on it on the podcast yet, but Robert Scott hooked it up and made some custom Nikes. What are those? What are those, BZ? Air Forces. Air Forces. You know what Air Force is. I do, I do, I do. I'm just making sure I didn't want to look stupid. I'd be over here saying friggin' Kobe Bryant 66 <laughs> 66 XL. I don't know. I could be I could be over here screwing up big time. And for but, the record. Lester has changed that to da- that date to Friday, July 28th for his announcement. Mm, mm, okay. He's switching up on us left and right here, but none, it's going to be at the end of the month, which is good. But, yeah, here's he and Mike Norvell also wearing that a shirt, shirt there. Wild. I think that's which his mom I think mom there's, a fam- the there's a family tie to this shirt. I think that's his mom on the shirt. I think there's a – there's there's a tie. There might be even might be even deeper than that. I don't know. Maybe someone in the comments can let us know. I saw something in Discord. Someone was talking about it. Um, but yeah, really cool, really cool stuff here. You know, it, it just seems like just waiting on it to happen type of deal at the moment. We got to wait a month, literally a month from now. We'll be waiting for that commitment. So uh, we'll see what ends up happening there. But that is a really talented cornerback that Florida State could be adding to their arsenal, which is needed, you know, and it's much needed for sure. But to have that kind of caliber talent is huge. And that's what makes, you know, strengthens the whole Florida state DBU argument. 
but yeah, Florida state's been on him and for a while and that relationship has been built and it's just, it's time to happen, time to happen, but it'll, it'll be great to have him there because then you added on, you know, recruiting with your bell cows, man, that's just, it's, it's huge and trying to finish off the class, but um, looking forward to covering that one at the end of the month. One last one though, I want to bring up here D to you as the number one safety in the 2024 class. This is KJ Bolden. Okay. Who also, also, you know, seems to be continuing to build a nice relationship for Florida state staff and getting to know coach Sertan now and his first season as being Florida state's defensive back coach. But uh, he actually had a few days in Tallahassee, got to talk with him as well. How do you think that went and any kind of takeaways that stand out to you? Yeah, I would say similar to Jeremiah Smith. It just kind of stands out to me that these guys continue to make their way back to Tallahassee. Um, Even for this one, for Bolden, you know, this wasn't an official visit. This was only – this was a multi-day unofficial. So, I mean, to come to Tallahassee on his own dime for multiple days to visit Florida State, in my opinion, that kind of says a lot. It says that he's still looking at them as a legitimate option. Is a guy who was also at Clemson, Georgia, Ohio State, Alabama, and Auburn on official visits during the month of June. Coming out of this trip to FSU, it sounds like he's going to take an official visit um, to Tallahassee. That one going to occur probably for the uh, the Miami rivalry game. Sounds like Florida State. They're really trying to make that probably the big weekend um, as far as the fall during the season. K.J. Bolden actually said that uh, Cam Davis and Landon Thomas, two guys that are also from the Peach State, have been reaching out and trying to get him to join him in this 2024 class in Tallahassee. Those guys continuing to do their part on the recruiting trail. Um, once again, you know, it sounds like this is another elite defensive back who has clicked with uh, Patrick Sertan, Sertan and uh, Mike Norvell. And I think, you know, this is another one. Just got to continue to stay the course, get him, for, get him in for that official visit. Um, he is probably going to announce a decision this summer. And, you know, I wouldn't expect Florida State to be the pick there. But, you know, if they do get him in for that official late in the season, they're going to have a shot to uh, make the flip. And right now I think he's probably going to commit to either Alabama or Georgia. But, I mean, these things, they're never done until these guys sign on the dotted line, especially when you're talking about a top five, top ten prospect. You know, these NIL deals, stuff like that, it's – gets crazy whenever you start getting towards uh that december early signing period and you know we'll see with jeremiah smith and kj bolden before the state right there in the thick of things for uh both of them yeah 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 definitely if you're able to get lester in the fold at the end of july start picking up some steam there and use your bell cows to your best advantage man why not but it ain't, it ain't over till the end that's what i've learned now definitely with nil being added and florida state being in the mix of what because of their product on the field, I'm not counting them out and anything, <laughs> anywhere, anywhere, transfer portal, high school recruiting, you know, there, there's some ways that Florida state can make some waves. So we'll see yep. what ends up happening there with Bolden, but really talented safety that we just like I was saying earlier, cornerbacks great, is, you know, with Lester, but safety is a major, major, major need for FSU as well too. You never know. And Bolden is a guy that grew up a Florida state fan and even mentioned in the interview, he's like, he said he was saying we when he was talking about Florida State, you know, <laughs> being being a guy that really grew up a fan of them and, you know, saying that he hopes they, they make the playoffs and, and win the national championship this year. So, so some more success on the field. Nice little NIL deal. We'll see what happens. Florida State, they're having plenty of success in Georgia. I wouldn't count them out for K.J. Bolden. Well, I think that's going to wrap up the entire recruiting segment of the show, which was an hour and – literally four minutes, but that's all she wrote. You know, now Florida state goes into a dry period, correct? Dustin and July yep. got a dead period until towards the end of July. It sounds like Florida state is going to host one final um, recruiting event this summer on that Saturday, July 29th. Like we said, uh, Charles Lester going to commit July 28th. So we'll see if Florida state uh, goes out into that Saturday with some good news. Um. Let's jump into Dalvin Cook because that's a highly discussed thing right now. One of the top eight, well, top free agent. He probably is a top free agent right now. Available on the NFL market. Uh, A lot of teams 
pushing and vying to get his talents on the roster, but uh, it was reported earlier today that the Dolphins had made an offer to him. But I just found now Dallin Cook just shot that down, or at least he said that he has declined a visit to the Miami Dolphins, Ooh. which is really interesting to me. That needs to be – and you got to cover that tomorrow. But uh, – <laughs> Good to know that. Just I'm glad I googled that because I was about to go on a whole spill about Miami. I mean, not saying that that completely shoots down, you know, Dallin to Miami. You know, he's got strong ties there, and you know, the Dolphins would love to utilize him with the talent Tyreek Hill and what they've already got there with Tua and making some strides on offense. But uh, he said he declined the visit to the Dolphins. I think right now, to me, not technically. If you if you keep if you keep digging, it says the oh. visit that Dalvin Cook suggested he declined was not the Dolphins. Both sides have interest. So, so I wonder, who did he decline? Yeah, it's, it's, who's he declining? So, yeah, now the question is who did he decline? Uh, hopefully it was the Jets because I can't the was the Jets, with Aaron right, Rodgers. Yeah. So, hmm. I'd like to see him with the Jets. We have nope. to watch that video no, for thanks. us, Logan, but. I don't know. Yeah. This one's, I, you know, I'm keeping a close eye. I got the alerts on for his stories, posts, everything. We're keeping a close eye. He did a little workout today. He's getting his 1% in. I don't know. I think, I think, I, I think Broncos, Jets, Miami. I think the thing with Dalvin is he's still searching for that top running back type of money but he's just not going to get it. I mean, that's just kind of where we're at right now. We're seeing the running back position continue to decrease in value. Um, you know, I, I know Dalvin Austin, he's going to get about 2 million or so from the Vikings for the season. So, I mean, that could help another club kind of supplement there, but it seems like as far as what he's demanding, no one's met that number as of right now. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see what kind of deal he gets. I'm kind of expecting like a, Two year, 12 million kind of deal with the second year being not as fully guaranteed in case the team needs to get out of it. Or if he wants to use it as a proof of deal and go somewhere else, he can do that as well. Um, I like the teams you mentioned. Miami and Denver both make a lot of sense. Um, seeing him in that Sean Payton offense in Denver next to Russell Wilson would be pretty fun, especially having another young back next to him in Javante Williams. I think that'd be a ton of fun to watch, but it would be weird to see him wearing orange. Do yeah, no, I don't think he likes wearing orange as well. And I and I will say, in like some random Madden franchise simulations I've done, every time I've cut Dalvin, he's gone to Chicago. It's happened like four times now, which makes absolutely no sense. Uh, I just figured I'd throw that out there. Why were Why were you cutting him though? Just like you know, just a realistic thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like, <laughs> him. Well, you I said you did it four times, so yeah, I get bored pretty easily. Yeah, Dolphins still with some of the top odds, Broncos, Jets, Bills. That'd be pretty fun with his I think, brother. I think he still ends up in Miami. You know, I think it's, it might take him a little bit to realize they're not going to get to that number that he wants. But at the same time, you get, to, you get to go home. You get to play on a team that's, I mean, playoff bound, in my opinion, as long as Tua can stay healthy. That has made some serious additions on the defensive side with Jalen coming in, you know, get to reunite with him. It just makes makes too much sense for him to go to Miami. He's still a good running back. You know, he's going to want to go somewhere that he can win and, and still play a lot. Though that clip insinuating that Justin Jefferson was good because of him was insane. It was one of the most outlandish takes I've ever seen. Did he say that? No, so that, that same guy that said he declined a visit from Miami oh. said, yeah, he made Justin Jefferson good. I was like, okay, that's a, uh, that's a wild statement. All right. <laughs> like I, I love Dalvin as much as anybody, but that's that's a little insane. I'm looking at an interview with Zach Hiller, who is Dalvin Cook's agent, and he's talking about you know he wants to go to a win now team, wants to get to a Super Bowl very soon, but said that you know just coming out of this interview, it seems like it's it's not all dialed in on him wanting to stay at home and play for Miami. They actually mentioned Florida state in here saying, you know, he could have gone to Miami there, but ended up going and playing at FSU. So uh, not everything is riding on being back home and quote, you know, he'd be fine with traveling and playing out of the state of Florida. So 
For sure. That's going to come down to money anyways, but. If you're talking about the Jets, Broncos, and Dolphins, I think Dolphins are going to be the best in this upcoming season. Whoa, 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 whoa. Mm. Whoa. Oh, no, got, not that. I think the Jets are going to make a stride. I think they're, I mean, they're going to be better with Aaron Rodgers there, of course, but. Take defense more is opportunities good. with Miami. I think, I think, uh, I think the Jets will make some strides. Yeah, Rain Johnson, wanna, second year. Does he want to split carries with Brees Hall? Whereas Miami, he's probably the primary guy. Yeah, he'd still have to split a little bit with a Kane and, and Jeff Wilson, but definitely not as much as Hall. And I'm not convinced Denver's going to be – I mean, they'll be better, but I don't think they're going to be some yeah. crazy that, flip around to the playoffs. Is there is there quarterback uh, Bridgewater? It's Russell Wilson. No, dude, it's as Russell Wilson. Well, it's Russell Wilson. As I said like three minutes he was, ago. He was terrible last year. And he was yeah, bad. He was, was really bad. It was awful. Bad, bad. Yeah, the Jets, I mean, they're expecting, you know, they're all talk and chatter because Aaron Rodgers being there, and now you got some of their players there saying, that, you know, this feels like Tom Brady in 2020. We're, we're, we're fine now. We're good. Yeah. But, you know, they're going to have to. The, the Jets are a team that's going to go 12-5 and five and lose in the first round of the playoffs. It's just how Aaron Rodgers' career is going. You think they'll win twelve? It's just, it's just, they're going to win more than they they should just because it's Aaron Rodgers and then they'll lose first round of the playoffs. It's one of those. Mm-hmm. Yeah, their division holds Buffalo Bills, Patriots, and Dolphins in there. So interested. To keep an eye on what's going on there with Dalvin. Uh, anything uh, basketball wise? I know we talked in the production meeting. VZ about some Baba stuff as well, and he's playing and competing right now. But also, ACC versus SEC challenge game announced with Georgia. Yeah. Where do you want to start? Yeah, we've actually got a couple things, um, even some that came up or something I remember while we we're in the middle of the podcast. But yeah, let's start with Georgia. Uh, the inaugural F- or the inaugural ACC SEC challenge was announced today, and Florida State will be pay- will be playing with one of their neighbors in the University of Georgia Bulldogs. Um, it's a really interesting matchup for as close as these two teams are ge- geographically. They haven't played since 1981, uh, which is kind of absurd, and really only twice since the 60s. It's crazy to think about. They have the, the Hugh Durham connection, who led both schools to their one and only Final Four appearances, 1972 for Florida State and 83 for Georgia. Uh, you have a VCU transfer on each team. You have Jameer Watkins at Florida State, and you have the brother of Kalen Deloach at Georgia and Jalen Deloach. It's, it's going to be an interesting game, and obviously Georgia's coached by our former friend Mike White, who was at Florida, and Florida State just beat up on for almost his entire tenure there. It's going to be an interesting matchup. Both teams are hoping to improve from where they were last season. Georgia was a 500 team at 16-16, and 16, and obviously Florida State was bad. Uh, it's, it's going to be an interesting matchup, I think. It, it's the perfect game for this. I think, obviously, the biggest storyline would have been being able to play Missouri, but this feels a little bit more on their – playing field and it's in Tallahassee and it's in Tallahassee yeah Dustin you and I won't be there with you though but you're going I am all right (laughs) (laughs) yeah you're going you're going I I was gonna say I'll see you there Dustin but I don't think I'll be there for that it's a Wednesday night at like 9 15 yeah I don't we'll be we'll be on here we got work to do people we'll be on here Wait, what date is that? It's the 20... Hold on. 29th? Something like that. I think it's after UF week for football. Yeah, it's it's after Thanksgiving. Oh, okay. Yeah, November 29th. So we'll be previewing an ACC championship, right? For football? Probably. Maybe. Hopefully? Potentially. Potentially. Hopefully. Maybe we'll be in Charlotte by day. Let's take it day by day. Okay, day by day. All right, gotcha. I'm just making sure. Uh, but yeah, VZ, look, uh, that's fun. Two big time programs like that going against each other. And sign me up. Well, two big time brands. Yeah, I don't not, know about not teams. basketball. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah, I was trying to word it right earlier in the tweet. Was... Two yeah, big two, logos. How about that? Yeah, two two huge brands that you know someone will look at at the TV and think it's football and go, "Ooh, that's interesting," and then they'll <laughs> click it and realize it's a very bad basketball game and click off. Whoa, come on now! <laughs> I told you I'm fully bought into basketball right now. I'm back like I never left. <laughs> Well, let, let me pull you right back down. Uh, oh, okay. because, Sounds good. Uh, earlier in the week, Darren Green posted on his Instagram story of him in a knee brace uh, that that caused a little mm. uh, caused a little rowdiness. Apparently, it was just a cleanup uh, f- from a for something real Scoop. basic. 
Yeah, just an arthroscopic, arthroscopic scope. He will should be fine by the regular season, but I know a few people mm-hmm. were, uh, were a little concerned about it. Now, well, now. that is kind of concerning because that's like one of your best players. Yeah, Hopefully just a little scopey scope. Your top shooter, there. your your leading or your leading returning scorer. Yeah, had enough guys, uh, FSU basketball wise, dealing with knee injuries the last year or so. Like, I mean, it's like, too it's like many. The plague. It's like the plague in Tallahassee. Knee injuries. Jesus, no joke. It's wild. Um, dude. But on a brighter note, Baba Miller has been playing for Spain's national team in the FIBA U19 tournament and has been playing pretty solid, uh, averaging 8.6 rebounds, about two assists. Uh, but he kind of blew up, you know, a few games ago when he shot four or five from three to go for 14 points and then followed it up with a 9, 12, and 10, or sorry, 9, 10, and 7. Hmm. Um, hmm. Seven what? Some, seven assists. Okay. Yeah, nine points, 10 rebounds, seven assists. Really solid game from him. He's he's looking much smoother, much more fluid as an athlete, much in better shape. His shot is still slow, but it's a lot more streamlined. Definitely looks like he's made some progress there, and it's good to see him get some action against you know better talent than he's going to play in college, arguably. And if I think they were just in what the yeah the round of sixteen and dominated Lebanon, he was plus thirty five in fourteen minutes just to Nice. Just to put in a comparison, but he's been playing pretty well, and we'll see if he can keep it up for these last couple of games because Spain's one of the better teams in the tournament. It's got to be big for him. I know he struggled a little bit to stay in shape coming off that 16-game bullshit suspension from yeah. the NCAA. Hopefully nothing fishy happens this time whenever he flies back to the United <laughs> States. Can we just keep him on the court for 30 games this season? You know. I, I know we gave we gave the kids some flack on the show last year during the season, but I mean it's especially tough for a guy to come over from Europe and then be suspended for 16 games and then have to finally start his uh, true freshman season in college basketball. And one of the well, I mean it wasn't last season. Normally one of the top conferences in the country. I mean it's really it's just tough to come in, sit out 16 straight games, and bang, you've got to hop into your toughest competition of the entire season. So, I mean, I really think, you know, Baba, he does have a ton of potential. And if he's able to realize that, that could be a major turnaround for Florida State. And he was dealing with injuries as soon as he got to campus last year. He had those shin splints pretty much as soon as he got to Tallahassee. And that's not something easy to deal with. That's something that you really got to let heal before you can go back out there and play. So hopefully he can continue being in this good condition. Because that's, that's something a few people told me last year at the NBA levels. He's got to get in better shape. And he looks in much better shape so far this summer. That's great to hear. Good for Baba. Uh, anything else, gentlemen? Anything else? Anything else? I don't think there's much more. Uh, you know, now with recruiting, I mean, that's going to continue, and Florida State's going to have a pretty busy, hopefully, fingers crossed, early month to it. So we'll have some good stuff to talk about on the podcast, but we'll continue to try to reach out and grab some guests on here. I'd love to get, if you guys ever, you know, suggest us some stuff, you know, suggest comment if you want some current players that are on the roster maybe a coach to come on here and discuss we'd love to have Tony Tokar Tokar's on here and we've also had a few current players on the roster come up but if you guys have any suggestions it helps us be able to just shoot it you know shoot an email over to Florida State and maybe get a chance of bringing one of these guys on uh, they always turn out to be phenomenal interviews and it's the time to do it before the season kicks in and availability goes down so uh, yeah we're heading into July gentlemen that means Two well, you could say two months, but it's really gonna be like three months. But we're we're getting close to September. We're getting close. Dustin, do you remember what date fall camp began on last year? I've been trying to figure that out. July. I have to go through my emails here. Twenty something. Well, it's, if, we're, if we're doing math, it's probably going to be after ACC kickoff, which is the 25th through 27th. July tw- Wednesday, July 27th was the first day last year. July 27th? But that was also a week zero game, so I'm yeah. projecting yeah. to start a week later, first week of August. Because right now the kickoff, like Austin was saying, FSU is on the 27th. Sixth. They're on the 26th. FSU is on the 26th. It goes to the 27th, which is that Thursday. So you would think – that following Monday, they probably start, or maybe they wait till Wednesday again, like they did here, like August second. It's August second and Monday. No, that'd be the Wednesday. 
Yeah, August. so I'd say either July 31st to August 2nd. Mm, One of those three yeah. days it'll start. Okay. I would love for it to be August 2nd because the Bucks, God damn, they don't have a training camp that day, but then, of course, they do the next two days. But, uh, you know, definitely looking forward to at least getting up there for the beginning of fall camp and seeing what's going on. A lot of a lot of players, some newcomers, too, that we haven't seen in action with our own eyes yet. So, uh, you know, I'm starting to itch a little bit. You know, whenever that grass outside is, you know, freshly cut grass and you smell it, mm, you know, you know, football's on the way. It's already hot as a mofo right now. Humidity's here. It's just like give me that, but I need some football with it and we're, we're cooking. So, uh, but yeah, I think that's going to do it for this week's episode. Appreciate y'all. Sorry for not having an episode last week. We're back though. Nonstop. I appreciate you guys as always. I know a lot of y'all. Yeah. Until next week. Yeah. It doesn't stop until next week. Um, make sure you hit the like button too. We have 65 likes. That's a lot. That's been quite a bit for. Let's get that to 69. Yeah, can we get to 69 likes? There's <laughs> got to be a way, right? There's got to be a way. But I uh, appreciate you all like over it. 100 watching on YouTube, quite a bit on Facebook, and I know always our audio listeners hanging out with us. But appreciate you all. You can find this podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify. We're on every podcast platform available. Make sure you're following us on Facebook. We just hit 100,000 followers on there to shout out to all of our Facebook people. Twitter's rolling right now. We got a lot of Instagram content coming y'all's way as well. So just kind of gearing up, testing a few things here left and right before this 2023 season comes. And we're getting prepped on every angle uh, imaginable. So appreciate y'all. Have a great rest of y'all's week. And we'll see you guys next Wednesday at 7 p.m. Peace.